Welcome to episode 166 of This Week in Linux, recorded live on September 4th, 2021. From the Destination Linux Network, I'm Michael Tunnell. Before we get started this week, I just want to let you know why last week was the first time I missed an episode in over a year. Unfortunately, I was ill and simply couldn't record the show. In the past, I would have tried to record anyway. I think I've done like three sick episodes, maybe. I don't know. Uh, but I want to thank everyone who sent me well wishes on Twitter and on the YouTube community page and other places. I appreciate that very much. And in addition to the well wishes, a few told me that I should probably take a break, and that might be a good idea. But for now, I'm back, and this is your weekly source for Linux Good News. Of course, we got to start off this episode with the latest release of the Linux kernel itself with version 5.14. We're going to cover what's new and then a quick message from Linus Torvalds that he shared on the mailing list that I thought was too good to not include in the show. So let's start with what's new. They have new implement implementation of the core scheduling functionality, which is really important. We'll talk about that in a second more. Uh, removal of old IDE block drivers, but that doesn't mean that legacy IDE hard drives are not supported anymore. You can still use the lib ATA subsystem if you need to use an IDE hard drive for some reason. Also, the Linux kernel got mainline support for the Raspberry Pi 400 keyboard PC, as well as many improvements to various architectures, including RISC-V. Now, to talk about the core scheduling, this is important because this relates to security related to hyper-threading. So core scheduling has been worked on by hyperscalers and public cloud providers for a couple of years to improve security without disabling hyper-threading. Now, essentially, this allows better management of resources and how they can share a CPU core and ensuring potentially unsaved tasks don't run on a sibling thread of a trusted task. Now, this matters because of the Meltdown Inspector vulnerabilities that were found in 2018, and they've been working on improving this sort of thing since then because this is a very big issue that has been mitigated for a long time, but trying to addre address the bigger problem of the trusted, non-trusted tasks sharing the same core is something that was a lot of people were looking forward to, and it is now finally here. So by ensuring trusted and untrusted tasks don't share a core, they can more comfortably keep hyper-threading hyper enabled, which for public cloud providers is particularly important with the amount of VPUs that they can offer per server. Now, I wanted to get back to the quote that I mentioned earlier. This is a such a good quote, I just couldn't help, but this is the actually announcement for the release of 5.14 and also makes reference to the uh, 30 years of Linux. So Linus says, so I realize you must all still be busy with all the galas and fancy balls and all the other 30th anniversary events, but at some point you must be getting tired of the constant glitz, the fireworks, and the champagne. That ball gown and tailcoat isn't the most comfortable thing either. The celebrations will go on for a few more weeks yet, but you, you all may just need a breather from them. And when that happens, I have just the thing for you. A new kernel release to test and enjoy, because 514 is out. Just waiting for you to kick the tires and remind yourself what, are all, what all the festivities are about. Of course, the poor tireless kernel maintainers won't have time for the festivities because for them, this just means the merge window for the next release will start tomorrow. We have another 30 years to look forward to after all, but for the rest of you, take a breather, build a kernel, test it out, and then you can go back to the seemingly endless party that I'm sure you all just crowd out of. And also, this is another chance for me to say, because last week I wasn't able to do the show, as I said earlier in the intro, but uh, we had a 30 years of Linux DLN mega fest that was really awesome. You can check it out on the DLN uh, YouTube channel. We have highlights posted there. We have the full thing there, actually. If you want to check out the entire, I think it's like three hours long, uh, but also there, there's highlights from that. It's about 20 minutes long. If you want to just check that out, have those, I'll have those linked in the show notes below. And uh, again, happy birthday to the Linux kernel. And if you want to check out the latest release of Linux 5.14, links in the show notes. Kitty has been hard at work polishing up the Plasma experience with Plasma 5.23 getting closer and closer to release. And they announced something recently that kind of, well, made my latest video slightly out of date or will be out of date pretty soon. And that in the latest video, I covered uh, 17 tips in under seven minutes with a video called 17 KDE Plasma Tips that you didn't know. And a lot of people have commented that they didn't know all of them, but I assume there would be some people who would know a few at least. But there are quite a few really cool hidden gems in that video, so check that out. But a couple of these are related to present windows and the desktop grid effects. 
And in the one of the latest uh, This Week in KDEs, they announced the new QML-based overview effect. And it basically kind of is a replacement eventually for potentially both of those things, present windows and desktop grid. So it currently shows all of your open windows, just like the existing present windows effect. And eventually they have said, said that it's going to be replacing the present windows effect once it's, once it's ready to do so, and probably also the desktop grid effect as well. The idea is to show all of your relevant window-related functionality in one place, similar to the popular third-party Parachute KWIN script, which is awesome. We've talked about that in previous episode, and also macOS's Mission Control overlay. So at some point, we could have a overlay that includes Windows, virtual desktops, and maybe even activities all in one, which will be awesome. Now, another thing that's coming in Plasma 5.23 is the new accent colors. So in system settings, color pages now lets you optionally choose an accent color that's different from the one shipped in your color, your color scheme of your uh, setup of the default, whichever distro you're using, because they might have customizations of the highlights. And this is really cool because it makes it a lot easier to do a quick customization of the breeze theme without having to go into the the colors menu, which is really cool, by the way. The color system inside of Plasma is really powerful, and you can change all sorts of stuff, pretty much everything. But the problem with it is that it's kind of complicated to do so. Now, in order to change the accent colors, you just go into the colors page in Plasma 5.23's system settings and click whichever color you want, and then it applies that highlight to everything. So that is awesome. Makes it a lot easier to do a quick customization. And also, there's been a lot of bug fixes and improvements coming to her 5.23, such as the uh, updates, uh, offline updates improvements, which is really cool. There are some uh, people who don't like the whole uh, offline updates because it was uh, asking you to reboot quite a lot, and they said that they're going, they have uh, improved that a lot, and then Discover is no longer going to be doing it so aggressively, which is great. Also, many improvements to the Wayland session, which is great news. They said that it is almost ready, like pretty much ready to go. They has, uh, Nate said that he is using it as his daily driver, so that is great news. And also, multi-screen layouts are not, now retained across X11 and Wayland sessions, which is very cool because when I Use, when I upgraded to uh, the latest version of Fedora and switched and tried out uh, Waylon, it did some wonkiness with my layout, and that's because it didn't have this feature that is coming in 5.23. So that is awesome to see that, because if you have a very extensively customized layout of your system, because you have multiple screens like I do, it it is very nice to see that that's going to be able to go back and forth without having to worry about any weird glitches and stuff. So... So much more. I can't cover everything in this latest, uh, you know, upcoming release. But if you want to check out more, I'll have links to the uh, pointiestick.com blog from Nate Graham uh, from KDE in the show notes. GNOME 40 was a huge update that changed a ton of stuff. But most notably, the workflow layout went from a vertical experience to a horizontal experience. And GNOME 41 is not going to be that big of an update as compared to GNOME 40, as you might expect. But there are a few things that I want to talk about that are coming in the next release. Uh, but re quick note, we're talking about GNOME 41 because the beta is out. So just know that if you want to try it out, it is definitely in a beta stage and is not ready for production or anything like that. And if you try it out with GNOME OS, also know that that is built specifically for testing, not for using on day-to-day -day basis, similar to KDE Neon. So, you know, just keep that in mind. So here's what's new. First of all, we have a new multitasking panel in the settings window. This new settings tab allows you to configure hot corners, uh, workspace options, activate screen edges, and app switching, app switching preferences, all sorts of stuff like that. They also added a new cellular settings, which allows users to configure mobile connections and modems. Now, this will only appear if you have hardware that GNOME recognizes to display the, the, support, the options, but that's pretty interesting that they add that. They also have the uh, in, introduced in GNOME 40 the Power Profiles tool, and in GNOME 41 they have made a lot of improvements, and they've made it easier to quickly switch between profiles. Those profiles have also been really better integrated. So, for example, the low power profile is now automatically activated when a laptop battery reaches a very low level, which is great to see. Also, they have a new remote desktop app called Connections, and what this makes it possible to easily connect and switch between multiple remote desktop sessions. 
And there's also a lot more coming. And you'll, if you want to find out more about GNOME 41, I'll have links in the show notes for that. But let's move on to the next topic that's still GNOME related. The next thing is apps for GNOME website that they have launched. And now this is a really interesting approach because they're having a listing of core apps and also another set of apps they call the Circle apps. And we'll talk about that more in a second. But these apps are featured in this curated overview and they say that they are all built with the GNOME philosophy in mind. So not all GTK apps and not all apps made for GNOME are in this website. This is more of like a curated effort. But also, if an application developer wants to be a part of it, they can just submit to be a part of the GNOME circle. And we'll get to that more in a second. So there are core apps, circle apps, and development apps. Core apps are apps that are created by the GNOME team directly, and many of which come pre-installed in GNOME-based distros. Uh, There's also the GNOME development apps, and these are not apps that are in development. These are apps to develop and design new apps or make it easier to contribute to existing apps and that sort of stuff. And then there's the GNOME Circle. So GNOME Circle apps is essentially an initiative to be able to curate and promote applications made for GNOME. So if you are a developer of uh, any kind of application that is focused for GNOME, you can submit to be a, become part of the GNOME Circle initiative. And developers who are using the GNOME platform can apply to have benefits like promotion and advertising, but also be uh, qualifying to be a contributor for uh, the GNOME Foundation membership system if you want to do that. And if you want to check out, I'll have links in the show notes for the new GNOME, uh, Apps for GNOME website. This episode of This Week in Linux is brought to you by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean recently announced their new managed MongoDB service, which is a fully managed database as a service or DBOS. With managed MongoDB, you can focus more on building scalable high-performance apps and less on maintaining the database. This is not something people really want to do anyway, so this is fantastic. This is now a service from DigitalOcean. You simply offload your MongoDB administration to DigitalOcean, let them handle the provisioning, the managing, the scaling, updates, backups, and security of your clusters, basically everything. And DigitalOcean built this service in partnership with MongoDB to together to have like basically so they can ensure that you will get access to all the latest releases of MongoDB's document database as they become available. And as a listener of the This Week in Linux podcast and a member of the DLN community, you can get started for free. Actually, better than free, because with DigitalOcean, you're getting a $100 free credit when you go to do.co slash DLN dash Mongo. Again, go to do.co slash DLN dash Mongo, that's DLN dash M-O-N-G-O, to get started with your $100 free credit on DigitalOcean's new managed MongoDB service. We want to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of This Week in Linux. Up next in the show, we have some CentOS-related news, and that relates to CentOS Linux 8 End of Life is Coming, or is it? So the story about CentOS is a long one, but the, the gist of it is that Red Hat decided last year to restructure CentOS into a more of a development version of RHEL to improve community contributions and involvement, as well as it make it possible to improve RHEL as well. For those who don't know, CentOS was technically a community intro already, but the way it was positioned made it hard, if not practically impossible, for the community and companies to contribute to it. So this was a big problem for years, and since RHEL was developed mostly just by Red Hat, it meant there would be many delays for updates to get into CentOS. Red Hat decided to flip the situation, so CentOS became upstream to RHEL, and with this, there were many benefits for a lot of people and also some negatives for others. In fact, Red Hat even made RHEL available for free in some cases, such as regular individuals now having the ability to have up to 16 licenses of RHEL for free installed, which is pretty awesome. Also, a lot of other programs and stuff like that to get it for free as well. But anyway, if you'd like to know more about the details for the whole situation, I'll have a playlist in the description linked for all the previous times I covered this topic or topics related to this, as well as the time we interviewed uh, Mike McGrath from Red Hat on Destination Linux about this topic in the show notes and in the description. So, The reason why we're talking about it today is that Cloud Linux says their TuxCare service will extend the life of CentOS 8 up until the end of 2025, so for at least four more years. They say starting in December, if you're running CentOS 8 now, you can relax because now you can have a safe haven for CentOS 8 at TuxCare and have more time to plan your migrations. So this is really interesting because for many years, enterprise wasn't a hot topic and rarely made it on this show. 
But ever since the CentOS restructuring news broke, it seems like it has constantly been moving in terms of like the enterprise world been constantly moving. And I think I've covered CentOS related stuff this year more times than I ever had before in the previous years of this show. So what I'm saying is for many of you, this may not be that relevant, but for those that it is relevant for, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens next. For example, Alma Linux announced they now offer the ability to for more easily access the CentOS SIG repositories inside of Alma Linux. So CentOS SIGs are special interest groups, that's what SIG stands for, within the CentOS community that focus on small, well, not so small set of issues, but sometimes small, sometimes much, much larger, in order to either create awareness or to focus on development along a specific topic. Some of the more popular SIGs are Storage SIG, Virtualization SIG, and of course the Hyperscale SIG. Uh, this is significant because it shows just how much of a community-centric effort Alma Linux is doing because instead of rebuilding CentOS uh, SIG repositories themselves, they chose to integrate the upstream repositories instead, and that is always great to see working with upstream. So if you'd like to learn more about this news with Alma Linux or the CentOS uh, support stuff from TuxCare, I'll have links in the show notes below. We got a new status report from the Asahi Linux team, and for those unfamiliar, Asahi Linux is a project to create Linux support for the Apple Silicon such as the M1 Max. So there has been a lot of progress since the last time we covered them on the show five months ago. Initial support for Apple M1 landed in Linux 5.13. M1, the M1 represents a massive research engineering challenge, so there was lots of stuff, completely undocumented hardware, and one approach to reverse engineering the hardware is something called blind probing, which is not an efficient way to do it, and they said that it would be technically possible to disassemble and reverse engineer the macOS drivers themselves, but that also poses legal challenges that could put the copyright status uh, of the project in jeopardy, as well as being inefficient itself, since a lot of the code to, is specific to macOS driver framework. So instead, they decided to build a hypervisor that can run the entirety of macOS unmodified in a VM that transparently presents it the real M1 hardware. So this is super interesting. I mean, it's very different from a typical virtual machine, which is designed to run as a guest OS on top of a host OS and with a full set of virtualized hardware. Uh, this hypervisor is built on the M1 N1 bootloader that they also made, and it has hardware experimentation as a tool. And it's it's com it's a basically a completely custom implementation to make this work. And it's designed to mostly stay out of the way of the guest OS, running it in an environment as close to bare metal as possible. Now, this is very interesting because it allows them to have the support of the macOS underneath, but also be able to put Linux there as well. So this is so interesting because it, in, in addition to having access to the hardware, it interacts with it as, it's, as normal, even with full accelerated desktop features, which is very cool. Now, one of the biggest challenges they say for Asahi Linux is making the M1's GPU work, which is where their uh, Display Engine Coprocessor, or DCP, comes in. While there has been you know, early Asahi work within Mesa, they still need to ultimately assemble a Linux kernel DRM driver for that sort of stuff. But this is there's also some other work that's making that even more possible, which is just yesterday, the M1 IO, the M1 IO MMU driver was just merged into the kernel. And this is important because it's required for support for PCIe, Wi-Fi, USB, display, and pretty much everything else. It's a very important piece. So that's awesome to see that it's in there. And there's also work on creating a Sahi Linux installer for deploying the Linux environment on Apple Silicon hardware. Now, this installation is tricky due to needing to create a macOS installation first, so Apple will recognize it as a bootable operating system. But they are working on that, and it's great to see. Now, there are some people out there who you know, don't think we should even bother with supporting M1 Max with Linux, and I get it. Maybe the resources could be used elsewhere, some people say. However, I think it's great for two reasons. Well, many reasons, but here's two that I wanted to say, because first, I made a shirt that says Linux is everywhere, and not being on M1 Max would make that less true, so... There's that. Also, secondly, more seriously, Apple is pivoting completely to the Apple Silicon approach and without support for it, then anyone who has that hardware in the future would never have the option to use Linux. So we could miss out on a lot of potential users who want to try Linux on their computer, but couldn't. 
Plus, the hardware has some pretty good performance benchmarks and test results in general, so it might be appealing for those who want the hardware but also want to run Linux on it. So there's that. So it's really awesome to see the work and the, as so much the progression of that work happens so quickly from the Asahi Linux project. So that is awesome. If you want to learn more about this, I'll have links in the show notes below. Up next in the show is some great news for GPL compliance in China. Naomi Wu was able to successfully get GPL v2 compliance from a China-based smartphone company called Umidigi. I was unfamiliar with this company prior to this situation, so this is, could be some good positive publicity for Umidigi going forward, though it didn't start out that way. So what happened exactly? Well, a developer on Twitter tweeted about an interaction that she had with the, co with the company Umidigi as it was less than ideal. Pataritsias said that posted an email that had responses from the company that was not, well, they say that you can request the shareable source code at their Shenzhen office, only Chinese speaking people there, during working hours. So essentially telling someone outside of China that they would need to be in China and speak Chinese in order to get the, sor the source code. Uh, from my perspective, this is a roundabout way to tell them to get lost, you know? So it's safe to say that it's not, there was not much expected to come from this. And then another user tagged Naomi Wu on the thread to see if she'd be willing to take up them up on cl the, the claim to show up to their office. For those who aren't familiar with Naomi, she is a prominent tech YouTuber has, who has also happens to be from China and happens to be an open source advocate who has done a fair amount of GPL compliance work in the past. Naomi quickly took up the task and documented the entire process in a video on her channel. So if you want to check that out, I'll have that linked in the show notes. And this is great news because they complied. So first, thank you, Naomi, for taking up the task. And the more companies compliant with GPL, the better. The way she handled it is also very commendable because a lot of others might have gone about it differently and that could have easily backfired. I hope other companies will learn from this by seeing it's not about attacking them. We simply want them to participate in the community. And that's what the point of the compliance is because as soon as they complied with the request, the developers started making ports of the uh, post-market OS on, on the phone that they requested the source code for. So it is to help the phone manufacturer to get more people interested in it. So it's not just because it's, it's a compliance feature or the license or some legal issue. It was more to participate in the community. So that is great. And I also hope that others might, you know, look at the attempt that Naomi did and use something similar to that because the way that she handled it was very impressive. And if you would like to see it for yourself, I'll have that linked in the show notes below. And if you'd like to learn more about licensing and the GPL, then be sure to join us tomorrow for the live recording of Destination Linux episode 242, or you can watch the edited version, which is published later on. But anyway, Destination Linux 242, we're going to talk about GPL, licensing, and all sorts of stuff related to it. So check that out. This episode of This Week in Linux is brought to you by Bitwarden. Get started right now with your free account at bitwarden.com slash DLN. Bitwarden is an awesome piece of software, which is a password manager that allows you to have peace of mind knowing that your online accounts are secure. How does it do that? Well, it provides many types of tools. For example, you can store your passwords in a secured vault and automatically fill in passwords for you in login forms. So you don't have to do that. But also, you want to have a different password for every website because that is proper password security. And that is also possible with Bitwarden because they have the auto generator to make the passwords for you. So you don't have to do any of that stuff. You can also access your, your data across many different types of devices, whether it's your web browser extensions or mobile applications, desktop applications, and even on the command line. Plus, Bitwarden seals and encrypts your private data with end-to-end -end encryption before it ever leaves your devices so you know you're the only person with access to your data. So go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started. And did I mention you can get started for free? Well, you can, but I also think you want to check out the premium accounts because they have a lot of great features and it starts at less than a dollar per month. That's right. Less than a dollar per month, you get one gigabyte of encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, U2F, Duo, Vault Health Reports, Bitwarden Authenticator for temporary one-time passwords, Priority Customer Service, and so much more, including their new service for Bitwarden Send to be able to send files back and forth to people. It's just fantastic. So you can get all of this for less than a dollar per month. And you can also 
get other options like the family accounts or the business accounts. So for example, if you have people in your family that you would like to help set up with their password manager, you can create a family organization account and help them build out their service so they can you know, get used to using it. If they're not familiar with it in the first place, it kind of be hard to just kind of get started if they've never heard of it. And you can help guide them that way with that account. And the same thing goes to business accounts. So if you have employees that you would like to set up with a password manager, you can do that through the business organizations and the organizational vaults. And it's just so awesome. So check it out for less than a dollar per month to get started. Go to bitwarden.com slash DLN. And thanks again to Bitwarden for sponsoring This Week in Linux. Up next in the show is a new Ubuntu-based distribution that is really interesting because it is based on the Cutefish desktop environment, and it's called Cutefish OS. We talked about Cutefish desktop environment back on episode 156 of Twill. Before a quick recap, it is a new DE based on Qt and uses KDE Plasma as a foundation and has a iOS slash Mac style design. But quick note for testing, uh, this is for testing and development purposes only right now. It is not ready for usability, but if you want to try it out, you can do so. Also, this is not a recommendation at all because I have not tried it out myself, so I don't know how well this works. But if you want to try it, I'll have links in the show notes. But this is really interesting because it is a whole new DE that is based on Plasma, which everybody knows I'm a fan of Plasma. And it's this is based on Kubuntu 2104, and I'm a fan of Kubuntu, so that sounds interesting. Uh, they have a lot of... Uh, uh, in, in addition to having their own DE, they also have their own applications. So there you have, you know, some pre-installed KDE apps and some other apps like Firefox and VLC, but they also have some native Cutefish apps like a file manager, a calculator, their own custom terminal and a settings hub, as well as a lot of other uh, custom structures set up with like the, the drop down panels and that sort of stuff. And they also have a like an interesting layout that is very similar to the Mac uh, with a desktop dock, which can be moved to the left or the right. Also, they have a top panel with a global menu and a full screen app launcher and so much more for their customizations. And in addition to this, they also have another package manager in, in addition to apt, which they call tap. So apt is, of course, the managing of the Ubuntu based distro itself. And the tap package manager is created to manage updates in the Cutefish desktop environment, as well as the Cutefish uh, specific applications and that sort of thing. So if you want to try this out, I'll have links in the show notes below. And if you do, let me know what your opinions are. I have, again, I have not tried it myself, so I don't have any opinions to offer you or recommendations or anything, but I'm curious if you decide to do so, let me know in the comments. And again, links in the show notes. Up next in the show is the latest release of Endeavor OS. So Endeavor OS has a lot of improvements for the installation of both in features and in performance. For those who don't know, Endeavor OS is a cool distro designed to be an easy introduction to Arch Linux. It's basically a, it's not a fork of Arch Linux, it's more of a distro based on Arch Linux, and it has a focus on being co uh, compatible with Arch Linux, as well as having their own uh, custom approach to design in terms of like specific DEs and also making it possible to easily and pick and choose whichever DU you want from the installer, which is really cool. It's similar to Intergos, so if you're familiar with that, you might not be if you're new to Linux. Intergos was a distribution that kind of did the similar thing, and in fact, I was a, for, you know, fun fact, I was a contributor to Intergos. I was on part of the team, and they, but that distribution ended a couple of years ago, and from that, Endeavor OS came. It's actually a successor to Intergos, so they have a similar approach for those who are familiar with with that one. Now, this latest release, they say, is a significant step for the future of the project. Now, first of all, they have a lot of new, they have new apps, they have some new changes to Calamari's, but I first want to talk about the new mirrors they have, because they have uh, two new mirrors, one in France and one in Singapore, and this matters because, depending on where you are in the world, if you don't have a, you don't have the mirrors close to you, it might take a while to do the installation, so it could take up to 30 minutes, depending on how fast the, the servers are. It could take even longer, depending on how much you have, how far you have to go to get to the latest one. So having it in do new regions is definitely fantastic to hear. And also in this latest release, they introduced a new application called the EOS Apps Info, which you can probably imagine, it gives you info about EOS apps. So it lists all the custom apps that are made by Endeavor OS for enhancing the experience of their distro. 
This app contains manuals of each app with instructions on how to use them, and unlike most te technical documents, it also includes pictures to show you how it's supposed to work and things like that, so that's nice. But uh, there's also one weird thing about it. The EOS Apps Info app is not installed by default. You have to install it yourself to get access to it. I think that should they should change that because this is something that should be there by default, making it easier for people to learn about the different apps that they make and that sort of stuff. So that's my opinion. If you want to take it, great. Otherwise, you know, there you go. Now, the biggest changes for this latest release is the updates and stuff with the Calamari's installer. They say that they have improved performance and speed of the installation itself. Now, they have made a lot of changes in terms of configuration, so we're going to talk about that. When using auto partitioning in the installer, ButterFS can now be used, including with the possibility to create file system with a subvolume scheme. Now, of course, Extended 4 will still be there for those who want to use it, but I'm a big fan of ButterFS, so I was really happy to see that they're putting effort in there. Also, the Wi-Fi setting used in a live environment will automatically be installed during the installation, so there's no need to re-enter the password on a new install, which is very nice. I've talked about that in previously. There are some times where some distributions don't have that you know, passed on to the installation, and it can be a little bit annoying like having to do it over again. So it's really nice to have that. It's not something you would notice because it's the lack of having to do it, but I just wanted to put it out there because it's any distribution that doesn't have that, please look into it. Also, when you choose the XFCE4 and i3WM uh, options in the online installer, you can now choose to select or deselect the theming for Endeavor OS. So if you want a vanilla experience for either XFCE or i3, you can do so now on, Ende on Endeavor OS. Now, I'm not sure why you'd want to have that because those are not the, the most polished vanillas, but you can do it. And it also, you get the same kind of experience with the rest of the online installer options because they have uh, 10 other options or something like that where you can pick out, you know, GNOME or Plasma or, uh, or LXQt or whatever and be able to, you know, get a vanilla experience with Endeavor OS. So that's pretty cool. They also made a new option so you can choose to install the Linux LTS kernel instead of the regular Linux kernel if you want to do that during install. And also an option to use parallel downloads is now available during the installation process, which decreases the installation tri the time dramatically. So they say, and I quote, the installation time is already incredibly fast by default compared to the previous ISO. But for people who have a fast and reliable internet connection, choosing parallel downloads can be a lightning fast experience. They also provided some test results saying that online install times from, you could even see them from uh, 15 minutes down to three minutes, depending on the available in internet speed and options selected, which is super interesting. Now, if you wanna try out Endeavor OS, you'll find links in the show notes below. Up next in the show, we have a distribution that is super easy, barely an inconvenience, and that is Linux from scratch 11.0. Now, I'm kidding about the being super easy. It's the most uh, complicated, difficult thing to install of all di Linux distros because it's not really a distro. It's more of a book that guides you. We'll get to that in a second. So anyway, the Linux from scratch 11.0 no longer uses the split user system. That, and that's related to like how most current user distributions have um, you know, bin has a, a symbolic link to user bin and, you know, lib and sbin are also symbolic links as well. And so they're, they're changing that up, which is good because it's, it's more up to date to the latest, like the current style of distributions. Also, there's updates to GCC 11.2, glibc 2.34, bin utils 2.37, and also the latest uh, update for the kernel is 5.13.2. Now it's not the latest kernel as we talked about 5.14 come out, but Linux from scratch goes, it's a completely different type of distribution because, well, it's a book. That, that's right. It's it's really just a book. The Linux from scratch is much different and it because it really it really just kind of guides you through the process of building your own Linux system from, well, from scratch, of course. Now, for comparison, people like to say Arch Linux and Gentoo are hard to install. And for many, that is certainly true. And actually, for most, it's true. But Linux from scratch takes that to a whole other level. The way I like to describe it is, you know, let's take a car analogy, for example. Most distributions are like, you get a car, you go to the dealership, you get your car, you're done. Uh, Arch Linux is like, you buy a kit car and you put it together. A uh, Gen 2 is where you find the parts individually and piece them all together and then build the car. And LFS is where you manufacture the parts yourself first 
and then put them together building the car. So that's kind of a good analogy. Maybe not. Let me know what you think about that description in the comments. But this is interesting in terms of like, if you want to really get into the deep depths of Linux and how to build a system, it will teach you. It will take a while to learn, but it will teach you a lot. And if you go through the process, I mean, I think the fastest I've seen anybody do it is like a week because it takes so much time because you have to configure every little flag of everything and compile it and all that stuff. But it does teach you quite a bit. Now, some people say like, you know, you learn a lot from the Arch Linux install. That's true, but you learn a lot more from the Linux from scratch install. However, it is also significantly difficult, more difficult anyway. Now, also the new version of LFS has a system D package that is also being released with LFS. So this package implements the newer system D style of system installation and initialization and also control. So that so for those who are, you know, wanting to learn about that sort of stuff too, that will be in the latest version of LFS 11. So if you want to check that out, I'll have links in the show notes below. The Document Foundation has announced the latest version of the free and open source Office Suite, LibreOffice. This latest version is 7.2 Community Edition, and there's a lot of improvements related to inoperability for uh, Microsoft Office file formats. They say that over 60% of the code commits for this version are focused on inoperability with Microsoft's file, uh, proprietary file formats, such as adding faster opening of the docx documents and that sort of thing. Also, they have a lot of other stuff as well, such as adding initial support for the GTK4 toolkit, the ability to compile with WebAssembly. They also added font caching for faster rendering, as well as performance improvements for the Calc spreadsheet application. And they've also dropped the OpenGL-based drawing code in favor of routing all the code through Skia, as well as something else that I want to talk about, which is fantastic to see, is that they added a command palette. Now, for those who don't know what a command palette is, I've talked about it on many occasions in this show. So if you have listened to the show many times, you you might already know. But if you don't, command palette is a way to quickly access features inside of an application. Now, it was first introduced to me from the Unity desktop environment through the HUD, which stood for Heads Up Display. Not a very good name, but whatever. And it basically allowed you to do the command palette function across every application, which was awesome. Uh, but since that's no longer a thing that's you know people are building, it, there's a lot of other approaches to make Command Palette available in the different applications and different desktop environments and that sort of stuff. So, for example, uh, KDE Plasma has the K Command Bar, which is a way to implement this sort of thing in KDE apps and all sorts of stuff. But to see it in LibreOffice was really great because I was I'm super happy to see that because LibreOffice is one of those applications that would really really benefit from a command palette where you just activate a search fun- or you activate a keyboard shortcut and then start typing for the feature that you want and then implement that feature. That is because there's so many things you can do in LibreOffice and so many uh, features and tools and you know submenus inside of submenus and that sort of stuff. A command palette is fantastic for this sort of thing. So I'm really happy to see that. And if you'd like to check out LibreOffice 7.2, links in the show notes. Up next in the show and the last topic for today is Libra Elec. And this is a lightweight, purpose-built Linux distribution for running Kodi on current and um, popular media center type hardware. So this is the latest version of 10.0, which is based on Kodi 19.1 and its code name Matrix. Uh, this is the name, the code name for Kodi itself, so they adopted it as well. Uh, but there's a lot of really cool stuff in this latest release. So they add, they have support for a variety of different uh, ARM devices as well as x86 and virtual machines and that sort of stuff. But in this latest release of Libre Elect 10, they added HDMI output up to 4K30. They've added hardware decoding for H.264 and H.265 as well as HDR output for support with HDR10 and HLG and hi, uh, HD audio pass-through for Dolby True, True HD and DTS HD, as well as many other things. So if you want to check it out, I'll have links in the show notes. But just real quick, there, there's no, it doesn't support all of the hardware you might expect it to just yet. So it does have some stable support for all winner uh, and rock chip devices, as well as some generic stuff like x86 x86. Uh, machines and virtual machines options as well. But the situation for the Raspberry Pi is a bit different. So there is a lot of stuff working already for the Raspberry Pi 4. 
Uh, but it is brand new in terms of the support, so there might be some bugs. But they are, you know, they do have a, a very good support for the Raspberry Pi four so far. But they say that the early versions of the Raspberry Pi, like the uh, the Pi Zero or the Pi One, I mean, that's not it wasn't really called the Raspberry Pi Zero, but it effectively became that once they started giving numbers to it. But those are no longer supported by LibreElect. And the Pi 2s and the Pi 3s do not have usable versions just yet, but they are working for support on those. Now, what's really cool, if you're not familiar, is LibreElect is allow you to easily get a appliance set up for having a Kodi Media Center box. So essentially you take a Raspberry Pi, for example, specifically the Pi 4 for this version, and you can in, you install the uh, the LibreElect into an SD card, put it into the Pi, and now you have a basically a set-top box media center from that. So for typically when you want to use Kodi, you have to install it into an existing distribution when you go to Kodi.tv itself, and that's great. It is a fantastic media center. Uh, but at the same time, if you wanted to create an appliance, it would be more difficult to do that because you have to build the distro, then also put the Kodi in there. And this way, you get uh, a lot more benefits because it also customizes certain features and adds extra things that are more uh, easily accessible directly inside of Kodi's uh, settings and stuff like that, which is very cool. So if you are in the um, you know, in the market for a appliance for running Kodi Media Center, then check out LibreElect, especially since they have their USB SD creator, which makes it a lot easier to get started with that. And again, if you would like to, links in the show notes. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on this show, then please like that smash button and be sure to subscribe. If you'd like to support the show and the channel, we have multiple ways to contribute via Patreon, sponsors, PayPal, and many others. You can learn more by going to tuxdigital.com slash contribute. And if you become a patron, you can join me during the live stream in the recording stadium to discuss stuff between topics and just hang out every week after the show in the patron-only post show. Also, if you want to support the show, you can do so by ordering the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt or the This Week in Linux shirt that I'm currently wearing at the dealinstore.com. Plus, while you're there, you can also check out all the other great stuff at the store like at hats, uh, mugs, hoodies, stickers, aprons, backpacks, all sorts of stuff at dealinstore.com where you can get stuff for this show as well as anything else on the Destination Linux network. And while you're also at the Destination Linux Network, you might want to check out the rest of the great podcasting goodness and also YouTube slash Odyssey channels that are there. So you can check out my other shows like Destination Linux and Hardware Addicts as I'm co-host of both of those shows on the D on DLN. And there's a, so much more. We got GameSphere, DLN Extend, uh, we got Pseudo Show, so much. And you can also check out some other videos from DOS Geek and more. So just a reminder, also, this show is live every Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern or 1700 UTC. So join us in the live chat room to discuss all the latest Linux news each and every week by going to dealinlive.com. Unless I get sick sometime, then I might not. But typically, every week, with a little bit of an asterisk next to that. But, you know, you get it. <laughs> Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell with the Destination Linux Network, and I'll see you next week for another episode of your weekly source for Linux. Good news.